Reverend Crystal Cox. We're reading PTSD Time to Heal by Kathy O'Brien. <coughs> okay, are you ready? We are on page 61. Break routine. So, okay. Yeah, I'm bouncing around. Breaking routine is a necessary safety measure while you are in your healing process particularly for those who've endured deliberate high-level trauma. <coughs> okay. We, okay, we identify our belief system. Our belief system moves into our knowing. Our knowing creates reality. Okay, say there's a flat surface. Okay, you go over to the same spot over and over and over. You develop a groove. Okay, that's another example. Neurons, nerves, actually regrow in our body to do with the way we respond. So we have to practice new ways. Um, and with what's been happening in, in 2020, we've practiced all kinds of new ways, right? So people have stopped their jobs, stopped going to school, stopped sports stuff, stopped. Um, they've completely broke their routine and it's broke the spell. It's broke the trauma. It's broke the um, MK Ultra. All the programming is being broken. Um, especially in mass, but we've been reading in this book about marijuana, right? In those states like the state I'm in where marijuana is legal, and you know, probably some of you do it in other states, uh, it's, that's why they fought so hard to not make it legal, because it, it, it removes the programming. It's too funny. Okay. Um, habitual routines can be a source of disassociation or worse. A deep subconscious mode, which is why they want to keep you in the jobs and sports and go and here and keep your focus on what they got and their news and their... Okay, so habitual routines can be a source of disassociation or worse, a deep subconscious mode by which to keep in contact with as yet unidentified abusers. So you're in contact with them. Your body knows there's an issue, um, but uh, they're unidentified yet. This inadvertently hinders the healing process. Since you are rerouting the neuron pathways of your brain and lifting out of well-worn ruts, breaking routine is a very effective brain exercise. For example, if you usually relax by disassociating into video games, then take a walk instead. You can just do something different in your routine every day. Um, and also, I would practice with using different words, and then I would, I would be like, uh, a rhinoceros with a yellow hat riding a bicycle. Like, imagine something I've never imagined before or thought that I would, to get the brain thinking in different ways. Okay. Um, many video games are patterned after military training to desensitize you, as evidenced by their effect on society. Walking outdoors in nature opens the mind and can be healing on many levels. Walking uses both sides of the brain at once, which is very helpful to a healing process. Take a notebook with you. Always keep a notebook within reach. Skip church for a while if that's your routine. Whatever your routine is, skip it. It is best to put beliefs aside through your healing process anyway. It is easier for people to believe in religion than in themselves. And it takes conscious effort to avoid that easy routine. You are in the process of learning who you are. Surely any deity would allow for healing from trauma. Besides, you cannot cure a problem on the level of the problem, and religion cannot cure religious abusers, abuses, religious abuses, whether they are cult, whether they are cult or occult. Do not expect to remember according to learned judgments. It is easy to fall prey to reprogramming due to heightened suggestibility from PTSD, trauma, and abuse. Until you reintegrate, know your own truth, and neuron pathways are open for free thought. Avoid looking outside yourself for answers or confirmation of answers. When my 10-year-old daughter, Kelly, was counseled that memories she had written out were not real, she wisely told her therapist, Your beliefs do not change my reality. Love it. Know your own truth. This is absolutely key. Know your own truth in absolute reality before sharing your memories with others. <coughs> it is wise to change your routine pattern for safety purposes as well as keeping you consciously present and exercising your brain. Choose a different grocery store. 
read food labels, try something new, walk your dog the other way around the block, take the kids to a different park, wash clothes on a different day, park in a different parking spot, um, drink your coffee after you comb your hair. <laughs> You're like, wait longer before coffee, you know, do lemon water, do a walk, do something else, just change your routine. Okay, exercise in the morning rather than at night. Bathe instead of shower. Pack your lunch instead of buying it. Change anything that will make you think rather than go through routine motions because that keeps you in the trance. Unplug your phone. Turn off your cell phone. It is so important to do this. I mean, we're so neurotic, right? Oh, hello, did my friend message me? Let's go to Facebook. You know, I find the times that I leave the phone in another area, you know, or like, um, you know, I leave the phone here at the church and I'm sleeping in my car or whatever, um, and I don't have access to it, I have a much more peaceful night. Because, you know, you constantly wake up because you want to stay connected to that and, and you get, you know, whether you're getting attention or seeing what's going on in the news or Facebook. And so take time away from your phone, like even in a different room, you know, like I think 12 hours, like, I mean, seriously. Okay, temporarily stop texting. This is your time to heal and it is best to avoid allowing daily routine and interruptions get in your way. You need to be writing out your memory and avoiding routine conversations with others will help you to stay focused on your healing process. Besides, with your past so pervasive, talking on a phone may inspire you to talk about it. Remember, writing out memory removes walls of compartmentalization while talking before writing it out and observing the 21-day rule will entrench it further. You should have quiet time to self-focus and filter what you wrote out and or find ways to cope with it. Walking especially with your dog is very helpful toward, toward filtering and coping. A note regarding technological harassment. Tone calls are the most important reason to turn off phones during the deprogramming process. Tone calls use harmonics to trigger programmed victims into action. Thus, keeping a phone on is akin to being in, abuse space, in an abuse space. If you are in a safe environment with someone you trust, ask them to screen all calls while you write out memory. Personally, I still avoid answering the telephone until I know who it is. Remember, you may not yet consciously know who all your abusers are, and therefore should wisely avoid unscreened phone calls and texts until fully healed. Technology continues to advance at such a rapid rate that there are newer and more modes of harmonic intrusion than I ever experienced, than I ever experienced. As U.S. government whistleblowers bound by law from speaking outside of personal experience, I can publicly offer only personal inside information. I do know from Kelly's and my experience that thoughts can be technologic, they can use technology to implant thoughts. Your phone is that best way. If you are currently being targeted, the best advice I can offer is to learn coping skills that render activation inconsistent. Right, so even if they turn it on, you're agitated, you're, you're you know, you're just, uh, like, like today I was like, ah, like this, this, or, or like, or you want to. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what I mean is, no matter what triggers you, or how weird it feels, if you just sit in it and don't react, they don't win. Their activation is rendered mute, ineffective. Being aware is key. Think twice. Consider other perspectives. Think beyond your first response. Keep a journal. Apply all healing methods offered here from nutrition to wearing a watch, and coping will minimize effects of harassment. Various frequencies are all around us, and some people are naturally highly sensitive to them. DIDs with heightened sense are more apt to, tune, to attune to these frequencies and may feel as though they are being personally targeted, stalked, or watched. All of us are subject to being watched these days in view of advanced technologies, so it is helpful to remember that those who suppress truth and operate under a veil of secrecy are clearly the ones who have something to hide. Focus outside yourself rather than obsess over harassments 
in order to decrease their effectiveness. Okay, so when something triggers you, it can really be anything. Instead of going within and storing it or in focusing on what they've triggered, uh, you know, watch a, a funny movie, go for a walk, read a book, distract yourself from whatever it is that they've turned on with the frequency. And by they, I mean this can also be a trigger. This can be someone dying. This can be um, a breakup. It can be a frequency that they've put through the phone or the air. It can be some sort of chemical. It can be anything. But once you've reacted, if you just sit in it and don't like take it to the next level, um, that's kind of what it's talking about, in my opinion. Consider that our criminal justice system is literally that, and know that it is counterproductive to use a courtroom as a form. True justice has come in many forms. To me, the ultimate justice is positive change through public awareness. Courtroom justice, in our case, was never obtainable for so-called reasons of national security. Right, because they didn't want people to know they were doing that, right? I know from experience that technological intrusions can occur in a courtroom under a blanket of national security. Juries can and have been techno technologically manipulated and witnesses silenced on the stand. Be aware that a courtroom is not an effective forum regardless of evidence. Been there, done that, seen that, wrote about it thousands of times. Safety is first and it comes with awareness. Okay, the next chapter is called Perceptions and Semantics. Words cannot fully describe the incomprehensible. Words can't even get in the way of expressing or understanding, especially when dealing with previously undefined phenomena or heightened senses. My daughter Kelly was bogged down in a quagmire of bureaucratic red tape, bureaucratic red tape, injustice, and mental health systems, unequipped and uneducated to deal with matters of so-called national security. Seeking help for the unspeakable quickly gave me insight into perceptual semantics and socially engineered ignorance. I felt like we'd emerged screaming out of a hell that no one knew existed. There is no such thing as mind control, we were told. We tried the word brainwashing. You mean hypnosis? Like, they don't get it, right? Hypnosis to the extreme, combined with torture, in order to program us for government black ops. Another quote, like after that. No one can be hypnotized to do something they wouldn't usually do. Right. Uh, so this is what the mental health professionals think, because they don't get how how this programming works. And if you're hypnotized, you wouldn't do something you normally wouldn't do. Uh, I'll leave that there. Your mental health, this is another quote of, I think, what they were said to them. Your mental health diagnostics manual was deliberately censored from mind control and healing from it. And you are quoting it verbatim. My daughter's life is on the line here. I'm talking about mind control. MK Ultra Mind Control. She's telling this to the therapist. The therapist says, there's no such thing as mind control. Okay, this is but one example of how words can get in the way. It is important to expand your own thinking beyond perceptions and semantics as you read this healing information. Understand meaning beyond words so this knowledge can be internalized and applied to your circumstances and need. Disassociative Identity Disorder, which is the DID, Disassociative Identity Disorder is professionally defined as the mind's sane defense to trauma too horrible to comprehend. Because DID is a new term in the field of mental health, those suffering from it are often misdiagnosed, mislabeled, and ultimately mistreated. What you have experienced is so individualistic and beyond mental health's academic censored vocabulary that understanding yourself is first and foremost. Know thyself. We're all on our own learning path and labels tend to box us into a temporary point in our journey. Victim may have been applicable to you back when abuse was occurring, whereas survivor may be more applicable now. DID was previously termed multiple personality disorder. This is a misnomer because it is because it is not multiple personalities. It is one person, one persona divided into compartmentalized memory. 
Each compartment has its own perceptions limited to the traumatic experience contained within. When compartments are deliberately or inadvertently triggered, that perception presents and may appear very different from other projections until fully healed. This, <clears throat> this phenomena of compartmentalized perception, projection, usually includes facial changes. Consider how emotions like anger, happiness, and surprise affect facial expression. And compound it to the degree that even vision can change dramatically. Which muscles are tensed and which muscles are relaxed creates vastly different appearances. Trauma intermittently opens eyes wider with whites around dilated pupils and micro muscle movements fail to coordinate. Fail to coordinate. Smiles appear plastic and insincere, never shining through traumatized eyes. <coughs> we have been wearing masks for a year, society. The he, one of the huge things I noticed is that I can't fake smile. So you know, you're going through the store and you're like, excuse me. The, the, the waitress, the, the whoever, there's no, no fake smiling, right? But when they smile for... When they smile for real, their eyes light up. Isn't that beautiful? Like, I was sitting in this restaurant, and I was, you know, this old woman, this lady was at the table, so, you know, she got to not wear a mask. And I wore one because I was waiting for it to go order. So she smiled at me. It was really sweet. And so I smiled back. And it wasn't like it wasn't sincere. It's just that it wasn't like a smile. Like, it was just, I smiled back, and then she was kind of like, so then I, you know, her heart, and that love meant more to me than whatever rules or whatever. I put the mask down and I said, I'm smiling, really. And they smiled really big at her. And I do that to kids, too, at the store. I smile because... I, uh, anyway. Superstition begins where knowledge leaves off. And pertinent facts on trauma were suppressed from mental health and labeled top secret after Hitler's Nazi and fascist scientists were brought to the U.S. in Project Paperclip. Subsequently, superstition regarding effects of trauma flourished, with DID slash MPD touted as demonic possession. The vast ignorance of the mental health and justice system regarding trauma was so extreme that the first help offered my daughter was exorcism. She needed to gain peace it's peace, P-I-E-C, and then slash P-E-A-C. So peace, peace of mind, not cast memories out further. Mark and I began speaking out on the reality of mind control for Kelly's sake, for the sake of our military veterans, and for people everywhere who have endured trauma. We began by educating mental health professionals, law enforcement, attorneys, congressmen, and anyone who had ears to hear. I guess that would be everyone. I know, it's metaphorically, blah, blah, blah. Speaking out to churches was akin to trying to help someone who was still in their abuse space. Religious indoctrination closed ears, eyes, and minds to reevaluating beliefs regarding possession and exorcism as pertains to those suffering from the effects of trauma. Likewise, mental health professionals struggled with the words mind, brain, spirit, and soul depending on what they were educated to think. Mark and I struggled to expand their thinking beyond words, focusing on them on how to think and not what to think. Be mindful not to assert perception before you heal and know how to think free again. Remember, there is more to consider than one memory compartment, limited experience. What a relief it is to know that the negativity brewing deep in that subconscious compartment is not all there is to this world. Once it is written out and removed from its subconscious confinement, it dissipates in light of truth. Writing out memory frees you from those negative subconscious drivers. And so in part of my healing work, methods that I was taught um, through spirit, through my, my teacher, um, that... In, especially in this new earth energy, that all we have to do is acknowledge the belief. 
<coughs> and I do it, you know, with the EFT tapping. If I feel a certain emotion, I go, what must I believe to be feeling this? I must believe this. I must believe that. You acknowledge the belief. You take the unconscious belief that was handed to you from your programming, from your ancestors, from your lineage, from your childhood. You take, then that's what rules your life and what you do every day, your routine, everything. You take that unconscious belief that may or may not be yours and you make it conscious. You go, oh yeah, I must believe this. And then you go, oh, I believe this or I don't. And you can see it. You don't have to make any changes. You don't have to do any therapies. You don't have to do anything. But in this new energy, and like this is talking about, acknowledge the belief and it dissipates all of the other obstacles. And, and it, it, it's amazing. Magic. If it is not written out, that rabbit hole of perceptual negativity can leak into your everyday life. It can cause dangerous crossovers whereby you may, for example, suddenly perceptually view yourself negatively and accuse an innocent friend or lover of making you feel that way. Uh, let me read that again. If it is not written out, so if it's not outside of you, it lives in you, it can be triggered by somebody you love in some situation, it can cause dangerous crossovers, for example, where you perceptually view yourself negatively and you accuse an innocent friend or lover of making you feel that way. No one can make you feel that way. Uh, they've just triggered something in you that was already there. It is easier to be mentally lazy and blame someone you are safe with than to face the repressed memory. Write it out. In worst case scenario, crossover can happen in the heat of love's passion where you suddenly feel violated due to subconscious perceptual intrusion. Heated arguments often result as a failure to communicate. It is difficult to see beyond the moment when operating from compartmentalization, limited perception. And far too easy to blame the ones closest to you. If you find yourself in such a situation, realize, and it's spelled R-E-A-L dash I's, realize, it is difficult to see beyond the mode you're in and reevaluate your position. So just sit in it and, and get a new perspective, but just kind of sit in it and don't really react. Um, it is not about being right or wrong. It is about righting wrongs. Write it out. Think further. Make note of flashes when they happen before they blind you to reality. It is wise to keep a pen and notebook at, by your bedside all the time, at any, any time. Always keep a pen and notebook within reach. Okay, the next page is called um, Deep Listen. So we're going to stop there for now, for today. And, um, oh, this is good stuff, huh? So, PTSD, time to heal. Kathy Bryant, thanks for listening. I love you.